Afu Bay. This is Misael Bay, aka Warlock Asylum, coming at you with Simon Necronomicon lesson number four. And today we're going to talk about what is the meaning of a gate has been broken. In the uh, testimony of the Mad Arab part two, he mentions that the abyss yawns before him and the gate has been broken. I think to answer that question, we first have to find out what is a gate, right? And I think that will help. And the reason why I thought this would really be good is because once we can get that, you know, out the way, whatever, we can really um, kind of understand the text on a much deeper level. So let me um, pull up my screen share again. Let me make sure I got the screen in the situation that it needs to be in because this is going to be really entertaining. I hope you guys are enjoying the series. Please mark subscribe, subscribe to our channel. And uh, we got like a whole bunch of, of goodies in store for everybody. So I'm about to open this up. Um, okay. So I think we're good to do the share screen now, all right? So there we go. Let me share this. Okay, so this is really interesting because when I was around, this information wasn't really known. But as you can see clearly here, it says these are the three car signs carved upon the gray stone that was the gate to the outside. So this is the gate to the outside. And that's what he means by opening up the gate. Be careful when you open up the gate. The gate is is the gate to Ganzir, right? That should be sort of like much more or less obvious. The gate that's opening is the gate to Ganzir. You know. So in order to use that power, the dragon to alert power that was mentioned in the prior video. The Aga and Ara signs are together to make sure that that power, it, it sort of puts an imprint on that energy so that it conforms in, in the best direction. You know what I'm saying? Let me just say that it informs in the best direction. And this is the amulet, okay? This is the amulet. And when you understand that this is the amulet to the gate of Ganzia, then we understand what it means, how Shamash could rob the gate of its power. When you look at books like uh, by Francis R. Lonemont, Chaldean Magic, he discusses how the sun could dispel the power of the underworld. Okay. And so this is what the situation means. Now, to bring it up a little bit deeper, what does it mean like when a gate has been broken? So that's the gate. Now, what does it mean to break the gate? It means that you allow room for the forces of Kerr, the forces of Ganzia, to become open into the world. And usually what happens is that invokes um, unwanted change in your life, it could, you could see death in your life, uh, a lot of different things. And the Mad Arab, although he writes the text, he had mastered the craft of um, walking. So he put some signs in there in the text to sort of illustrate what not to do based on his own personal experience. You see what I'm saying? So, a gate when it's broken, it is definitely could lead to a lot of different unforeseen occurrences and tragedies for the practitioner. There are many different ways that a gate could be broken or open when it should be closed. Because he mentions in the text how a person can become consumed or how an ancient one could exist on top of 
uh, in this world for too long and they will have to be banishing by using the conjuration of all powers, okay? A lot of cases, the first case is just misunderstanding the information in the text, you know? In the prequel, the beginning of the book, in the introductory notes, it says that this is book is not for, for a book of beginners. You know what I'm saying? And a lot of people come in who've never worked with anything similar and come into it. So usually they would have to have some sort of guidance. And it's just karmically unfit for someone who doesn't have guidance to offer someone guidance because they learned a few rituals. You know what I'm saying? They should understand the Necronomicon by Simon as its own living entity. And from that, you will understand pretty much how to deal. The second thing in situations when it comes to mentorship is that each one of us is here to learn lessons that we need to balance our spirit out. And those lessons are different than the next person. So I may talk about the information to bring it clear so that people won't stumble upon and hurt themselves but as far as like anything that is like accentuated or that's like a personal charm you know I'm, i may like to do this or whatever i really don't get into that too much because um the lessons that you may have to learn for your spirit to grow are probably different than mine i never really met anyone who had the same life lessons that they need to learn in life and so the um necronomicon will speak to an individual differently based on some of the things they have to learn however in the initiation process there is still some sort of straight on consistency that all of us can gather around and talk about just like if someone is in a christian church or in other religions they may have different life lessons to learn also actually they do all have different life lessons to learn but in the commonality of the deity that they're worshiping they understand they can relate on the same text things of that nature so i would say you know uh that the gate a gate can become open based on information that's unfounded uh i'll give you an example with the Simon tone, the Necronomicon by Simon, everything that you need is within the text. Additional research is encouraged uh, for like understanding the trials and tribulations of some of the deities in the text. And that's pretty much logical. I mean, it's impossible to get every myth in one book, you know, that happened to Anana Ishtar or to Shamash or to Inki. So that's why he says, take what is here and discover the rest because here is the blueprint. Now you have to educate yourself. And from that education, you become more aware of how the text works, your relationship with it more about what your own path is and all of this and everything becomes a lot more clearer um and that's very important because mythologies what they really are are ways to teach you how the energy works when you understand them so when you read about ishtar inky and, and, and ishtar i think inky and anana inky and ishtar and how she steals the mees from inky there's a whole lesson in that that this illustrates how Ishtar energy works or, you know, other energies, Nagao. Nagao is another important because it is the Book of Kutha. So you want to become familiar with Nagao's myths and how Nagao came to rule the netherworld, things of that nature, because that teaches you the relationship between Kerr and, um, you know, the, the starry lands the heavenly uh, celestial deities and what their relationship was, things of that nature. So these are very important aspects that, you know, can really determine how far you can in practice and also intention. So let me talk, discuss some ways in which a gate can be broken. 
keeping a watcher in the world, right? In the text, it says that the watcher should be banished. I don't really necessarily agree. I don't even think it's an idea because there's nowhere in print that a watcher should be kept into the world. A deceptive energy might convince someone, hey, man, you need to keep me into the world. But that's something, if it belongs someplace else, it needs to return there. You know what I'm saying? Why would you want to keep something out of its habitat? There was one time I remember I went to the watcher. This was years ago. Um, and I had a fascination for crows. Crows are very intelligent, you know, and I wanted a crow. So I went and I asked, hey, can I have a crow? You know what I'm saying? As a pet. And there were some things I had offered in return. The so next thing, you know, I'm sitting on the step having a cigar. I think it was like a week before Christmas or whatever. And I look out as a snowstorm. And I see nine crows descend onto this tree and they're staring into the window that's in the sta staircase. It was like a tenement building I was there living in. So I'm looking, I'm like, oh man, this is a little bit crazy. And then I walked in, not at the time that I had the apartment. If I was to walk in, it would be down this long hallway till I got to the living room. So one crow followed me all the way into the house, into the apartment, and there was my crow. And my roommate and I at the time, he was like, nah, man, we can't keep this thing in here. This is not a tame bird. And I was like, yo, man, I want to keep this crow. And then I thought about it because crows are like family. They're like, they have an, a family nucleus. So like if the parents have young and they go out to get food and stuff like that, you know, the older brothers and sisters of the young or the grandparents will watch the young until the parents get back. You know, it's very communal. So when I realized all of that, I was like, nah, you know what? It needs to be with its own family. So in the same thing with, you know, the watcher, you have to realize that there's a lot of traps in the Simon Necronomicon. And one of them, Anybody who works with the Simon Necronomica, let me say this, for an extended period of time, I mean like an extended period of time, and understand the system knows that it's more of a shamanic system, probably possibly more mystical than it has anything to do with Western magic at all. I mean, the stuff, I don't think these ideas about the Necronomicon being hoax or garbage, but if there's any aspect of it is that is a hoax, it's putting Crowley in the mix. You know what I'm saying? Because it really doesn't have so much to do. In the beginning, I would think so, because there are similarities in all paths of the unseen, right? There are certain principles that you learn, and those are the principles that you should know when you're going into the text, you know what I'm saying? And those are things for you to do. It's not my role to do that. It's not someone else's role. If a person is interested in any other path, I'm imagining they do as much research as possible because they really absorb the path. If you're not really interested in that path and just looking to get something out of it, then you're going to ask a whole bunch of unnecessary questions. You know what I'm saying? And the thing is, is that what people don't realize is that when you invoke the Watcher, you invoke that entire world, that entire pantheon that's in that book to start observing your way of life. And you come under that kingdom as if you were an American citizen living in America. You know what I'm saying? So you need to know and it's your responsibility to know if you don't pay your taxes, you know, the government's coming, they're looking at you. They're not looking at the next person. You see what I'm saying? So you have to be responsible to know what it is. Now, that doesn't mean in discussion, of course, because no one has all the knowledge and it's not even that type of game. Um, it's about learning and cultivating yourself. So, of course, in any path, people who've been in the path longer, they can advise a person, you know what I'm saying? Like, hey, you know, you might not want to do that, you know, because they may see really why, you know what I mean? 
and those things are important. So the idea of keeping the watch in the world, some people can say, hey man, I saw the video, but you know what, it works for me, that's fine. I don't see anything into it. So all I'm saying that to keep, to make a long story short, is that um, if you can't find anything in the mythology that identifies a similar action to what you have experienced, and you think it's a revelation about how you should work in ritual, I really wouldn't trust it. Because the thing when I was blogging, uh, for those who are watching this for the first time, uh, or who may have been to my blog or recent or whatever, I started blogging because I was like, why is this stuff in this book? Let me see, because at the time, not so much now, but really at that time, Necronomicon was like in everybody's household. Um, only a few people knew how it worked and a lot of people believe it was a hoax. So I didn't think it was a hoax because of some many of the things I was experiencing and I had already started going through its initiation. However, I want to see why these things were in the book. Do they compare with Sumerian mythology? Even if they're a, a, a bastardized form of it, do they compare with what you find in Sumerian texts? And everything that I found, with the exception of the Mad Arab, you know, part one and part two, it, its basis was someplace in Mesopotamia or someplace in part of the Asian world or some ancient shamanic primordial right everything in the book, it, everything in the book, right? Um, the things that weren't in these ancient systems, I knew that those were the traps. The other thing I knew is that the Mad Arab testimony, part one and two, are metaphoric descriptions of how the ritual works. You see what I'm saying? So that's how I kind of came in tune with, you know, the text and then I began to move on there and I came to serve you know I didn't come to try to get something out of it or whatever or you know because there's so many different reasons that a person wants to avoid that but basically what I'm saying is that when a person does um, stuff like leave the gate open a lot of bad misfortune comes upon that person. So that's why the Mad Arab says, be careful when you open the gate. Here it is, you only have to feed the watcher once. It says, if you feed the watcher, you can call the watcher as long as it's been fed in a month's span. So a lot of the work in the text is a lot more having to do with mental sciences than always, hey man, I need to talk to the watcher. I gotta pull out this bowl. You know, a lot of it is more of a mental science and how to approach things. And really, if you really don't want to have the gate open because you're dealing with Kerr, which is the land of the dead. So um, when that gate opens, um, you know, it's not really a good look. And this is why, like, when you read about Ishtar, you know, I'm going to cause, you know, make the dead outnumber the living. I'm gonna have the dead eat the living. All that stuff is talking about the gate opening. That's all references to what is experienced in the gate opening, which means that the presence of the dead in the world, and they're coming from a place that's malnourished, is to feed upon the living. So that means that when that gate opens, a life is usually demanded. It may be tra drastic changes in your life, you know what I'm saying? And these are things that you just don't want to encounter. The best thing, and I'm going to go into um, the text again, that a person could do is, you know, really follow the written covenant. Now, we talked about the Chaldean covenant and what that meant. But let's take a look at the written covenant, which is in the Book of Calling. And these are the agreements. I mentioned this before. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, and I want to get specifically on the point that a lot of people may not be aware of using the tone. Let me go back into this. Let me share my screen. 
Okay, there we go. All right. Screen share. Okay, and you probably, if you have the book at home or in front of you, you could probably go through this. Um, it's in the book of calling. It's in the section where it says no sixthly, no seventhly, no fifthly. And those things teach you are the lessons of the gates themselves. When it says no fifthly, those are lessons within the gates themselves. No fourthly, that's Shamash. No firstly, that's Nana. No secondly, that's Nebo. No thirdly, that's Ishtar. So in these things is what the covenant that you have um, is expressed between those forces of the gates, but on the larger scale, the whole pantheon's tone, right? And this is what's this is one way that a gate could be broken. It says, no seventhly of the things thou art to expect in the commission of the most sacred magic. Study the symbols well, and do not be afraid of any awful specter that shall invade thy operation or harm thy inhabitant by day and by night. Only charge them with the words of the covenant, and they will do as you ask. Okay, so when he says only charge them with the words of the covenant, what that means is that if you set up your Agamasaratu and you're in ritual, really, you don't really get too free verse with it. You do things as they're pronounced, unless you can see a trapping and know it's a trap. You know what I'm saying? And you have that type of experience, then of course you can mold things as you need to. But if you're beginning, you're starting off and you start saying some wild stuff like, yo, you know, Frank did this or whatever, and you could just cause a whole bunch of harm to someone else and to yourself. And now you're going to have to be accountable for that. Because see, here's a bit of a difference. <clears throat> I've seen people say, hey, you know, that didn't work for me. You know, I, I can do this and get away with it. And what will happen is you start seeing people in your community or people in your building, people in your neighborhood, family members start disappearing. And the Mad Arab describes this in the first testimony uh, where he talks about, you know, being chased out of towns and stuff like that. Yeah, because they figured out, okay, you know what, we wasn't having these problems. And then this dude, he comes around and now we having all these problems. You know what I'm saying? I'm staying away from this dude. You know what I'm saying? Stuff like that. And that's people figure out over time. You know, then you find yourself with no one around. And that's because a gate has been broken. You see what I'm saying? Um, it can also happen with certain illnesses. A person could, you know, attract illnesses. A lot of stuff in the neck is very simple. But what complicates it is people's problems. You know what I'm saying? Because, see, the thing is this. It's another very important factor. When you start working with any system that magnifies your senses and everything, it magnifies the good and the bad. So you should be working constantly to reduce the negative aspects of your being, which is why he says, always call upon the gods in every empty moment. Like, you don't need to have some full-blown ritual. You should actually really avoid that. But you should think about the ruling forces, the true divine forces, you know what I'm saying? And that's very important. You know, a lot of, you know, in religion, um, the cult of the dead is the oldest, as far as archeological findings are concerned. The veneration of ancestors, the worship of the dead is the oldest uh, practice spiritually in the world, you know what I'm saying? And a lot of things stem from that. Jesus Christ is of the cult of the dead because he had to go into the underworld or sacrifice himself to save humanity, however they believe. You know what I'm saying? But the thing is, and this is why the world is the way it is, is that now you, be, you get into Christianity, if you're not Catholic, the whole Protestant system is a broken gate. Here this dude went to the underworld. They had a whole system of saints and all this kind of stuff. Now somebody comes and the development of Protestantism is not even accurate in history. Protestantism began because a lot of Catholic priests was going into Spain during the time that the Moors ruled 
And of course, a lot of the Moors were Muslim and Jewish. They was like, nah, that stuff is paganism. So this eventually caused a certain type of vibe until eventually some of them start speaking out like, nah, man, that's wrong. But really the Catholic religion is inherent of the Egyptian religion, inherent of the Mesopotamian ancient paradigm. So some people may call it pagan, but when you understand pagan, what it really means, that's not really a bad word, but in monotheism it is, right? So we get that. But in the process of them making Protestantism, they broke a gate. And this is why, if you look at indigenous people who are committed to Christianity, 99.9% of all the families of indigenous people, whether it be Asian, African, whatever, Indian, or whatever, they all got tragedies in their family. Because the only ones who really don't have that a lot sometimes is the Catholic, like a lot of people in Latin America. I'm like, man, wow, you know, Latin America is really striving or, you know, that sort of thing because they're Catholic. But anyone that's part of Protestant religion, there's a gate broken. And this is why you find so much tragedy in the Baptist church and so much death in some communities that are like, you know what, man, I'm going to be Christian, man. That's old stuff. That shaman stuff is old stuff. I'm going to find Jesus. And they have these church socks and ties and can't even fit into the suit, right? And then afterwards, they're having these big picnics and all this other crazy stuff. And then two weeks later, somebody's aunt passes or this happens or that happens. And there's no protection. So you have indigenous people, like African-American people, what's up with the church? Well, the Catholic Church is cool, but the rest of that stuff is a broken gate. It's a broken gate. Every single family, 99.9, but I can't even, haven't even met someone of color who's a Christian who don't have a tragedy in their family, unless they mess with the Catholic Church. Other than that, all those people have tragedies in their family. That's the Christian world. Islam and Judaism were also part of the cult of the dead because of the inner chamber of Solomon's temple. When you look at the design, there are older models of that same design in Canaanite temples that were dedicated to the dead. So the dead is not something evil, right? Because it, it can mean different things. For example, you could have prostitutes who die you know, whatever the case may be, um, drug dealers, alcoholics, and they'll be earthbound. They may join gangster spirits and like, look, man, you got to do this if you want to eat. We got to get some people to sacrifice you. So you got to imitate somebody to do something, you know what I'm saying? And we'll protect you. Be and this is what happens in the lower astral world, okay? Then you have ancestors. That's a different thing. Then you have deities who rule like kings and kingdoms where those kingdoms have poor sp spirits they have rich spirits things of that nature so you you know over the time you become more acquainted this is like a lifelong path you become acquainted with certain things it's like oh okay i get it you know like that sort of thing however you know man you know all religions today have a taint or stem somewhere shape and form from the cult of the dead you know what i'm saying from the original cult of the dead and that's not a bad thing you know it doesn't mean that it's evil because the graveyard it was a sacred place you know what i'm saying and then also there's a celestial aspect that was later compromised because of the people who believed in the cult of the dead. And what I mean by that is there's a book online. You can get it for free. It's a PDF. I have it in the N. Hedwana library on my website, and I'll post a link. You know, um, I'll post a link to a site that's not mine for the haters, and I'll post a link to my site where the book could be downloaded. It's written by a man named Peyton, who's a PhD. It's the only book of its kind. You would think that knowing that worship of chthonic energies and another world was the world's first spiritual path or the oldest based on archaeology i don't think it was really the first but it's where we have remains of the present world you would think there'd be tons of books written by this i only found two and one is this book called spiritism and the occult of the dead 
the cult of the dead, sorry. And uh, it's a fabulous book. And they talk about the influences into Buddhism, into Christianity, into all these different faiths that seem to be honorable, but all they are is broken gates. You see what I'm saying? Because they have a piece of something, but don't illustrate the whole paradigm. So the amazing thing about the Necronomicon in the terms of salvation is that we have the Chaldean covenant. Abraham was a Chaldean, but he didn't institute the Chaldean covenant. He instituted a Masonic covenant with Nimrod, who posed as Yahweh. And I have information on that. One day we'll go through it where you will see like these archaeological dudes like, man, <laughs> you know, Yahweh is Nimrod. I mean, that's obvious. Um, but if you haven't come across it, I'll share some information in the next video. I don't have it in front of me now, but I'll share some information into that. But my point is that all of these are broken gates, which is why mankind, he sleeps spiritually. Like the majority of people are not awake because they're broken gates. You have an opportunity. You know what I'm saying? Get on your work. You know what I mean? Um, so that that way, a lot of times, um, in your course of gate walking, there's going to come a time where gate's going to be broken. You know, part of it is training. You know what I mean? And that's why, like, you you can't really, you have to have a relationship with the dinghy to understand wrong and right in their jurisdiction. But you also have to have a way of validating that this is the dinghy talking. And that's by understanding their mythology. And if they act in discord to the mythology, then you know you're dealing with a trickster energy. You know what I'm saying? But a lot of times, in, in the course of your find, you will break a gate because you may not understand things the first time around. Like I said in another video, in the testimony of the Mad Arab part two, he says basically that people don't understand the text. They're still consumed by demons. And so the more that you understand, it's a sign that they don't have power over you. You understand what I'm saying? So the good thing about the neck is that it's, it is a living entity. So it's empathetic to people. In other words, it may see the full situation and be like, nah, man, give that dude a pass. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know what, let's assume some, you know, one of the entities to close the gate because they don't get it. You know, they'll learn their lesson, you know, another time around. So when you purify yourself, you start learning things and this purification is continuous and you start seeing things that you didn't see before and like, oh, I get it. But Whatever your intentions is, that's partially what you're going to get back. So if you communicate that way, those forces are going to communicate that way back to you. You know what I'm saying? The main thing to understand with the neck also, because I've seen this happen a lot of times, and I, you know, I really don't, that's what kind of slowed me down from talking about it publicly as much at one time. But then I said, you know what, let me put out some things because there are a lot of people who are sincere uh, you know, with their intentions and um, they may not realize what they're doing. But if they do come in contact with certain information and start realizing what they're doing and ignore it, then it's all downhill from there. You know what I'm saying? That life is going to, you know, pay for it. Eventually you're going to pay for it down the line. You know what I'm saying? Whether it may not be in your particular circle, but it could be in your children's their generations and stuff, and you done messed up the whole thing over some nonsense, you know what I mean? And that's another case where the gate is broken. It could also affect family members, um, just different things of that nature. So you want to make sure that you keep in tune with what you're doing and those things, because who wants the dead, that world spilling over into their realm, you know what I'm saying? Usually when you touch that round, you got to cleanse yourself seriously. You know what I'm saying? But the gate been broken, that means the gate of Gansey is open. And the medallion that the mad ab was given, it says in the text that the sun can rob its of its power. Shamash can rob the medallion of its power. And it's supposed to be, you know, crafted under the moonlight and all that stuff. And so we know now that the sun is something that can assist in closing that gate. You know what I'm saying? Consistent 
um, getting those energies back to where they, where they belong. Because it just means a lot of times a gate being open really means that something is operating in a place that it shouldn't be. So if you voluntarily, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, um, you know, hey, I'm going to keep the watch in the world and all that crazy stuff, then you voluntarily keeping the gate open. You know what I'm saying? Um, there's different things. Another thing that's popular that's not known, and it says it in the text. Let me see if I can find it so I can show it to y'all so y'all won't think I'm just talking, you know, whatever uh, out of my own deal is the walking itself. You know how many people break gates because they're walking and a lot of times they get disenchanted with the system because they wasn't really told um, the information properly. You know, let me just see. I'm going to try to do this quick. I'm going to throw this glasses on for this. I'm going to try to do this quick search. As you can see, these are readers, but a lot of times I have them on too much. So I try to take them off so I don't become addicted to them or the eyes weaken or whatever. Um, let me see. Okay, I got five chances here. Okay. I'm sure it's in the testimony. Um, okay. All right, let me see. Um, okay. Let me let me try one more. I think. Um, okay, so let me let me get a taste of this. Hold on, try one more word. Sorry, people. I just want to make sure I get this because this is very important. Um, okay, I don't know if I can find. Okay, here it is right here. Okay, I can share it now. I'm gonna highlight it and then I'm gonna share it with y'all. Actually, I don't need to highlight it. Let me just share it with y'all, okay. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Okay, let me pull this up. Okay, right here. Okay, I can see this. This is taken from the um, testimony of the Mad Arab part two. And this is what it says concerning the walking. And you know how often this is ignored? <laughs> this is crazy. It says, know that the seven spheres must be entered in their times and in their seasons, one at a time, and never, and never the one before the other. So all this stuff... <laughs> All this stuff about, you know, I'm going to walk Marduk today. Next month, I'm going to walk Nebo. The month after that, I'm going to walk um, Ishtar. You know what? You could do all those things, and it seemingly could be you can get some effects. But you're not going to really get what you need to get because you're just rearranging your life. You know what I'm saying? Gatewalking is not really the identification of the practitioner of the tome. You know what I'm saying? Either they're a priest of the elder gods or they're a worshiper of the ancient ones. Maybe they could specify it by saying, you know, I'm a son of Ishtar. I'm a priest of Inki. I'm a disciple of Inki. But a gatewalker by identification to the Necronomicon would be like a Muslim identify himself based on the fact that he does Hajj. How many times does a Muslim have to do Hajj? He may do he may perform Hajj several times. Initially, 
he will perform Hajj when he takes his oath. That's one time. If he falls away from the faith and comes back or feels that he wants to re-solidify his commitment and devotion to Allah, he may perform Hajj again, right? And he may perform Hajj once a year or several times. It depends on what his situation is financially and all those things. So gatewalking is Hajj to a practitioner of the Necronomicon, right? That's what it is, it's Hajj. So if you want to perform, first, if you're going to perform Hajj, even as you know, a Muslim performing Hajj, there's a certain way that it's done. It's not like, you, hey, I'm going to come here, I'm going to walk opposite the way everyone's walking, all this crazy stuff. And I did all those things, you know, because I didn't know what I was doing. So I was like, okay, got into this stupid stuff, trying to be Superman or whatever. But the reality of it is, is that when you look at the book, there's certain things, if you took the book literally, you actually would be all right. But the thing is, knowing that there's traps in there, it's like, mm, you know, your mind, you know, sort of gets, well, is this a trap? This is a trap. And your goal should really just be about aligning yourself with the divine world. That's what ultimately it is, you know, and so people, you know, they think that they can do something and all they're doing is just becoming addicted to something. You know what I'm saying? When you read the Book of Calling, right? Let me go into the Book of Calling for a second. Let me stop sharing my screen. When you read the Book of Calling, it says that the elder gods handed down this information, okay? So they were able to build an abode for themselves, summer land, if you will, you know what I mean? What people call heaven, that was not in the realms of the netherworld, okay? The celestial spheres, as the Mad Arab says, it is a celestial world, you know what I'm saying? It's distinctly different, you know? Um, and, um, you know, they were able to, you know, to, to get some things on or whatever. Uh, and, and that was good, you know. And so people, you know, on the other hand, they think, well, I can command this energy or this, that, and the other. And that's not the situation. They were able to find immortality by practicing these methods. And through that, they passed on information in a way that their descendants or you know followers however people want to call it they can figure it out you know what i'm saying they can figure it out um but a gate can be broken if a person doesn't follow the walking in the order that it appears in the book a gate can be broken you know and they won't realize it until months later when you walk a gate first of all let me say this when you walk a gate it doesn't mean that you're actually in that sphere, right? It just means that you performed the ritual and you made a petition to enter. And you may enter, but you may still be in that sphere. You see what I'm saying? Um, I'll give you an example. When a person walks the gates for the first time, that reconfigures their life. I would say, that for after they walk, because you have to think about the mad hour, he said 1,001 moons. So that carries for the practitioners today. There are 1,001 moons, which could be arranged from 74 to 84 years. But what it really symbolizes is when those gates have most influence in your life. So in a natural man's span of time, He's naturally walking. All the humanity is walking because we're on the globe that goes around the sun. And that's what Simon means when he talks about the landing on the moon, which is the first planet, could be, you know, us becoming closer to the ancient ones, right? Now, let me correct this term because there's so much out there that's loose. There's an ancient race of gods and demons. So saying the ancient ones, you could be talking about a god or a demon. 
right? So to say the ancient ones, you just talk about everybody in the book. It's not, we use it more to talk about energies in the Urilla text, but really it could be talked about by all of them in the book, you know? So when Simon said that about man's landing on the moon, that's what he meant. But humanity itself is going around the sun, going around the sun. When you're gate walking or you know, other practices like that, you're initiating yourself and you're going at a pace that's faster than man going around the sun. And that's why some people perceive it as a short way or, or too quick or something awkward about it, right? Some people consider that by people who work by the moon. Here's some things to consider. When you walk by the moon, right, the moon takes the shape of the planet. So in other words, if you walk in the gal, the moon reflects the gal's light and go and the moon goes through all 12 signs of the zodiac within one month. So you'll be able to see how the gal exists in each sign. You know, it's not going to be identical because there's different, you know, relationship between the planets and things or the spheres, I should say, you know, but the planets do represent the law that they create dictate. But I was going to say that um, mankind naturally, like Nana, deals with consciousness. So when a baby is born, his eyes open, he becomes conscious, this, that, and the other. So when the gate walker walks, the first gate, Nana, he becomes conscious of the astral world. The second gate, Nebo, a person learns to communicate. They learn symbolism. Um, they get communicated in dreams. Certain things they learn, gematria, esoteric arts. After a baby becomes conscious of himself, his eyes become open. He learns how to speak. That's a Nebo quality. Ishtar deals with love, relationships, family. In the mortal world, Ishtar's time begins at 15 years old, the adolescent years. They begin to go into puberty. So the gates... So when you walk a gate, you're restructuring your life, right? And what happens is a lot of people don't make it out the first gate. And what does that mean? The first gate, when a person gate walks, they're going to be in the gate for at least seven years. You see what I'm saying? But they can continue walking. So when you continue walking, what you're really doing is walking Nana of Nana, Nana of Nebo, Nana of Ishtar, Nana. and a person can get out of that fast if they're aware of what they're doing, but a lot of times they don't. So what happens is they'll become over infatuated with things that Nana represents, and also there will be challenges to their lunacy. You see what I'm saying? So they'll become, oh, oh man, I got to learn about this, about the occult, this, about, I want to astral project. I want to do this. I want to get this from here. I want to buy the dragon's blood incense over here. They'll just become obsessed. And it usually lasts for seven years. And then they'll start learning, like, you know what? How can I transform this into, you know, a practical thing where I can help service people in business? A lot of people will get it faster. But that's the process you're reorganizing your life. It's very important that you understand that. Now, when you understand that the mortal world is walking gates based on the fact that they're on the planet rotating around the sun, let me ask you something. What would a 12-year-old be called if they had a body of an 85-year-old person? There are diseases like that. That's what they're called, diseases. So if you are walking through the gates, and you decide, hey man, you know, I'm walking Ishtar this month, but I need to, you know, talk to a dar. I'm gonna walk a dar's gate. All you're doing is leaving the gate open. You're breaking the gate. It's a broken gate. You see what I'm saying? And if you wanna talk to a dar, you just pull out his seal in the ceremonies of calling and you call him. The same way you would orchestrate a calling with the 50 names. It's, it's nothing difficult about that. But the idea of walking him, that could be done if you want to reconfirm your commitment, but it's, that's not what they mean when you communicate with them, you know, or to communicate with them. That's just, you know, some other stuff. And then you, <laughs> the thing about it is 
there's a whole discussion about gatewalking that is just not even known because most people don't know that when they're gatewalking, they're walking the same gates that Ishtar is walking. If you look in the sleep of Ishtar and you look at the gates, at each gate, what was exchanged, what was said, specifically in the in the Simon tone. And then you look at the characteristics of the gates themselves, they all align. So you're going back and forth in this. And this is why at the end of the walking, it says that the ascent of Ishtar from the netherworld should be read. You know, now you want to walk out of order. And then all this stuff happens and then you gotta re you gotta walk to patch something up because you got to go over here to talk to this person. And this has nothing to do with what the Simon Tom is, but it has everything to do with you trying to access some power. Those is how gates are broken. Gates could be broken if a person talks negatively about an entity in the text. Gates could be broken if you write a, a part of the Necronomic and you copy it over and you don't complete the sentence and you just go to bed, a gate could be broken that way. You know what I'm saying? So when you're dealing with the Simon Tome, you're not dealing with Western magic. You're not dealing with a grimoire where you can command the energies. You may do certain things and you may have an outcome, but there's always a cost. And usually what I tell people, if you're gonna ask something, you have to, state when you're asking something what are you going to return you see what i'm saying and that's the way to understand but it's not even really about that you know what i'm saying if you you know this is about alchemating yourself that's some other stuff so i don't really even like talking like when people ask me questions about that sort of thing i don't even get into that really because that's not what i'm dealing with Maybe it's what they're dealing with. Maybe it's what they need to deal with. You know what I'm saying? I just don't deal with things from that angle. You know what I'm saying? Um, I look at it like, look, man, if I'm dealing with Ishtar, Ishtar is how old? 6,000 years old? So she knows what's good. And now that I walked, Ishtar is living within me. So, you know, as I begin to grow and develop, I find the answers out to those things. No one can remove or make you your virtue better you know what I'm saying? It's like, look at what life is. You know what I'm saying? Um, are you going to exercise or are you going to take a pill that makes you look more defined? That's the difference. You know what I'm saying? Are you going to ask some energy to do something? You're taking the pill. Or are you going to, hey, man, I need a little help with this. How can I get this done? I mean, I don't want you to do it. But just show me what I need to do and, and I can get it done. Sometimes you may need to ask, but don't like make it a habit because you make it leaving the gate open and things around you will um, implode on your life. There's one thing I'm going to say, I'm going to give an example because I've seen this happen. There was a guy who was very well known in the community of gatewalking. I'm gonna say it because that's the term we use so something else comes up. And, um, you know, he was very respected and stuff. And people were telling him like, yo man, you got something stuck on your back, man. You know, something's on your back. Like, I don't know what it is, but it ain't good. And what had happened was the way this person was exercising the conjuration of the watcher, people with sight could actually see this thing was stuck into his back and he became ill and it wasn't good. You know what I'm saying? And to be honest with you, the only reason why certain things, you know, practitioners don't see certain things is because a lot of times those energies, they don't even attend to those people because it, it just ain't even worth it. So they'll draw some lower forms because water always seeks its own level. So your level is what you draw to you. You see what I'm saying? And and that's, that's basically about it. But in most cases where that happens, you're leaving the gate open. I've seen people not here. You might have heard when they were working on the Simon Tone people were passing. You know why? Because they were mixing it with other stuff. They were um, 
they wasn't taking it seriously. You know what I'm saying? This is like, oh, this is a book, you know, whatever. And, you know, we'll try it out, but we're going to go in it with this type of mindset. Then just don't do it at all because then it becomes something else. It's like if you know someone and they're from America and then you try to say that they're from Italy and you find someone from Italy and say it's this person, they're really somebody else. You see what I'm saying? They may have some semblance. They could even be related, but it's just something else. So now if you have these preconceived notions, first of all, if you're in another system, I've heard this, so many, this is another way a gate could be broken. Someone could be in the system, right? And they could be in a magical system. You know, they could be in a system called uh, refrigerated dawn, something like that, just because I just can't think of a word at the time, or I don't want to put a name of a group out there, but we'll just call it refrigerated dawn. So they become indoctrinated in this. They learn it, they become initiated, they get to the highest levels, but it just ain't doing what it needs to do for them because they're looking for something that nothing can give them, right? So anyway, they hear about the, the Necronomic and like, oh man, this book is ridiculous, da da, whatever. Okay. So now they start doing the rites in the Necronomic and they're like, hey man, I'm going to put this through another type of process because I'm going to alchemate it like this because this is what I learned as this or this is what I learned as a Satanist or this is what I learned as this. And they wind up getting themselves in trouble. You see what I'm saying? And um, this is why the people were dying when the Necronomicon was getting prepared for publishing because they were trying to make it fit into some paradigm when it's something else. That's like if a person's dating a woman and the woman seems similar to someone he's dated before, and he just assumes that this is it. That ain't going to work. There was a situation where there was a guy who was a Santero. This, this example can translate volumes to what it means to, op to break a gate. You know, a gate has been broken. So the guy, he was into Santeria. He was a Santero for 10 years. And then, you know, he started... Like, yo, man, you know what? Let me get more towards Aoife because for some reason it seems a bit more, you know, pure or whatever to him, you know. Um, so he started going into that. Anyway, when he was in Santeria, he worked a lot with Oshun and he had set up his own, you know, some of his own rituals that work within the workings of Santeria. So when he got initiated into Aoife, he was like, man, you know, this is great. But one day he was like, you know what? Let me talk to Oshun in Ifa, right? And he, <laughs> but what he did was he used a method that he learned in Santeria. Oshun came down and she said, if you ever do that again, I'm going to take your life. You see what I'm saying? So just because a person and you know, Santeria and Aoife are very similar in some regards, very different in a lot of different regards. So he thought, like, you know, they're similar. I can mess with this and this. And he just messed himself up. You know, he almost did. You know what I'm saying? And the same thing can happen with the neck, you know what I'm saying, where people can mess themselves up and they really need to learn what it is, you know what I'm saying? Because the reason why the Necronomicon works a lot of it is because of um, the incantations that are in there actually come from original text. You know what I'm saying? So you read a, a piece or a bit of something that someone really used seriously thousands of years ago. That's why it works ultimately. You know what I'm saying? Um, I've had my own experiences where energies have come down and be like, nah, you don't you don't want to really do that. You know what I'm saying? Some other systems, it could be more primordial. Like in, in Fudan, it could be extremely primordial. Actually, in Nenzu, some of the energies out the ivory tablets, they would definitely show up if you do something twisted. I mean, really, it would get scary. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, with the neck, it's a little bit more because there is other things in the mesh. Um, it's a little slightly more different. But still in all, you can mess yourself up. I've seen people leave, you know, because they were 
that wasn't just doing the right thing. I remember when I was gatewalking for the first time and um, there was a guy who he just didn't take the neck seriously. And he was like, yeah, yeah, you know, whatever. And he, he actually his first walking, what he did was he walked Nana and then he walked another gate after that because he had this theory like, you know, you can walk it the way the days of the week are coordinated. This is what he thought. So this is what he did. And um, next thing you know, he called us up and he said, yeah, man, I sent about 10,000 letters to senators telling them not to turn children the glass figurines. Like he lost his mind, literally. That was it. He was a college professor, too. He lost his mind. You know what I'm saying? Trying to be smart and gain power, you know. So as long as you're doing the right thing and you have good intentions, which is another amazing thing about the neck, is that they always judge your heart. And a lot of times um, I've made mistakes. I may have passed on some mistakes I've made, unfortunately. Um, but I know that how I came with this book and, and and some of the circumstances that I came into this awareness, um, you know, a lot of times these dudes, and I'm not saying that because I am, but like a lot of times it didn't give it like, you know what? His heart is a certain way. Give him a pass. You know what I'm saying? Because they respect virtue. They respect someone who's sincere. If you read the Sumerian epics, this is another thing. You read the Sumerian epics, you find out that like the deities uh, mostly respected virtue in men. They didn't respect anything dishonest. A lot of times the Dingir would change kingships if they thought a king was treating people unfairly. I mean, Gilgamesh is another example of that, where the people cried out and they made Inki do the challenge this dude. You see what I'm saying? When you look at Ishtar, when she came out the underworld, the demons was like looking for someone to take in her place. And even though she was married to the Muzi, he didn't care nothing about her. He he was sitting on a throne pridefully. So they took him. So really, virtue is one of the hugest qualities in understanding and being bestowed knowledge and power. You see what I'm saying? The Dinge, what they'll do is, you know, when people get into stuff, they got a lot of people asking them something. You know what I'm saying? And in some respects, when you know the laws of the mental plane, a lot of times these dudes will kind of achieve or seemingly achieve some of the things that's being asked for or presented. I don't think spirituality is about asking something for something. You know what I'm saying? That's just my personal opinion. It happens during the course of that. It may happen, you know, um, throughout the course of a month or throughout the course of a year. I just don't think spirituality, as far as a thing is concerned, is about asking and receiving. I just I, I just don't see that, you know what I'm saying? Um, it could be called spiritual welfare, but I just don't see it as far as like the growth of the person's soul, you know what I'm saying? And there was things, man, that we were doing in the beginning. This was in the very beginning. This before I even had a level to impart knowledge to people who are working with me or students or whatever, just before all of that. And there was a lot of mistakes. I never want to get too much of it, but it was really bad. You know what I'm saying? It was really, really, really bad. And basically I was like, you know what? Um, I'm just going to stay focused and I'm going to stay humble because these are energies that's been around longer than I have. You know what I'm saying? And I'm just feel blessed to be able to have some sort of relationship with something that people fantasically read about. You know what I mean? That's where I was coming from. And, you know, all that other stuff, I can just get that on my own. You know what I mean? So that's how I looked at it. You know, so for me, it's weird. You know, people are asking because I already know the answer to that. If you ask for something, you're going to have to give something. And it's better to say what it is than to, like, wait for it to be taken away from you. You know what I mean? And I just don't see what the point of that is. But I do know one thing, and this probably may clarify this up, because, like I said, the underworld is not evil. There's a heaven in, in, in the netherworld where the gods dwell. Like, when you look at Enki, Enlil, Anu, those are celestial energies, but that's also, but, but 
they have a separate law. But when they came to the house of Kerr, the Catholic energies, they had to respect what was going on there, like we saw in the case of Ishtar. And none of those energies could raise Ishtar out, right? Except for Inki. Here's something a lot of people don't know. Originally, sacrifice was only to deities of the dead. That's how we know Christianity is an underworld religion because sacrifice is involved. Historically, through anthropology, that was only for things that were deceased, period, right? What happened was when the, the celestial cults met the vegetation cults, over time, the idea of sacrifice was applied to celestial deities, but it it wasn't by nature in its origin. So celestial deities, they didn't have anything to do with like this stuff with, you know, quick, you know, raising the dead up and stuff like that. Later during the Babylonian period, um, a lot of energies you know, was able to do certain things. And for that to happen, those energies had to be put through the underworld. You know what I'm saying? And which these processes were like high alchemical processes that a lot of that stuff is just lost today. You know what I'm saying? Um, another thing that can open the gate, and I, I, I want to end, but I need to get into this, is paths, understanding the paths in the Simon Necronomicon, okay? Simon emphasizes that not to get into this thing of working with, the, you know, one side and not the other. And I find that to be true. Like, um, you need both. You need the to work with one side and the other from time to time. It's going to come up. And you're going to feel a certain way that you may feel limited just in one portion of the text. However... The Urilla text is not a path. You know what I'm saying? It's not a path in, in a true sense of the term. It's, it's an extension of everything else in the book, right? Everything in the book, if we're going to take the Urilla as a path, can be utilized as a path. The 50 names could be a path, right? That's how, like, the Urilla could be a path, but it's not really a true spiritual path. You know what I'm saying? And what you find is that those energies take off very quickly. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of things that I've seen happen in that world. And it's important sometimes to visit that world. You know, you may find some things, especially in the way of herbal healing, um, rejuvenation from disease. All those things lie in the text of the Arilla, the secrets of those things lie. When you really understand it, then you can kind of know how to use it. There's also the, the waters of life standing there too. Um, in the in the in a metaphoric sense, you know, uh, that sort of thing. Um, but as far as like it being a pathway, the mad Arab called Ganzia a broken star a broken gate. So it's not formed fully, right? These are decimal energies where the gods in ancient times will perceive this whole numbers, 20, 15, 8. These are like decimal numbers, fractions is what their numeric counterpart was according to um, Francis Lernemont and Chaldean Magic. It wasn't like they had whole numbers. You understand what I'm saying? So that sort of thing is not to be reckoned with like as a path because what has happened is the power is seemingly, you know, amazing for those who are seeking power. But eventually what will happen is that um, it will take you a longer, longer time to lose, to gain contact with the celestial forces. So that's why he talks about the gate because when you read myths, ancient myths, any ancient myth, they always thought contact with the underworld was led to ill luck. You can get a lot of different things, but it could also lead to ill luck. Necronomica doesn't really support that, not even in its title, right? But what I would say is that if a person's going to go through that round, you want to make sure that you cleanse 
cleanse, cleanse. Otherwise, you're going to lose contact with the elder gods. You know what I'm saying? And you'll find that people, they'll start getting into that and like, ah, I don't want to deal with them. You know what I mean? All that sort of stuff. Because the feeling is not constrictive. And the reason why is because when they were dealing with the elder gods, they were just dealing with gates. You know what I'm saying? They were just walking gates. They wasn't sitting down like, hey, I'm at the ceremonies of calling. I want to call this energy you know, with the Zekia Campa, Zeana Campa formula, now that I have the seal of the gate, they wasn't doing that. So they would just, so of course, the gates are going to feel constricting because they represent the gates in the celestial world, but really the gates that Ishtar walked when she was in Kerr. So they're going to feel funny because they're restricting. They're, it's a gate. A gate is like a cell block, you know what I'm saying? So now they get into the real sex, like, oh, man, it's like a breath of fresh air. I can, I, I can feel like I can move around a little bit. And that response comes from the fact that they were just walking the elders and never really built relationships or seen them work through calling them, you know, without walking their sphere. Or they were walking out of order. So you feel this, like, thrown from one prison to the next. and now in the Arilla, because it's not a gate, it's a broken gate, you know, they feel more loose because it's just not like got this intense thing going on. But the opposite side of it is that it's something that will feed off your own system. You know what I'm saying? And and you you know, when you, like how can I say it's like the Arilla text when I used to work with it. It will implement raw truth. There's a lot of good in it. Like I said, there's things that you may need to deal with. But it works with raw truth, and it works a lot with change. Anytime I would go in there, it'd be change, raw truth, and, you know, people would die. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's just that simple. You know, man, I even want to sugarcoat it. Because when you open that section of the netherworld, like, it's all a chthonic right ultimately because you're pulling on the dragon current and then you're using a celestial force of uh, Ishtarian force, a starry force that Ishtar personifies. You're also drawing off of that. So you have the chthonic current from the dragon currents in the earth and you also have the starry current. So, you know, you go through the gates, you alien. But then you can have access to the lands of the, the, the deceased and you can have access to the celestial worlds, and you could explore those to learn as a scientist would. But the real path is when is in knowing that you are from a race from the stars. That's the real path. You see what I'm saying? And so when you look at like Ganzir is good for some things, but a lot of times it produces change, which is good. You may need some changes and stuff like that. Things do go on. But it would try to suck you into its world and you become a servant of it. And it's a little bit twisted because when you look at the Book of Calling and other things, um, it mentions, this is the Book of Nams, it mentions energies that are in the netherworld. But Yurilla is slightly different than Ganzir in, a, in a some way, shape, and form. You know what I'm saying? And it takes, it takes a while to kind of appreciate that. You know what I'm saying? Whereas with the neck totally is very stringent is very pure you know what i'm saying in that sense so a lot of what's good about it is that if you go into a layer you're going to reach that layer you know but the thing about it is is that you got to be conscious that you are in some ways cultivating your spirit and will and not becoming manipulated by something else that's the main thing because that's when the gate becomes broken that's one of the biggest signs that the gate has become broken and we'll probably continue discussion at a later date um and get into some more stuff but that's really you know a lot of the scenarios of what it means when the gate has been broken this is misael bay aka warlock asylum coming at you once again with simon economic and lessons We'll catch you shortly. Ciao.